CF Jr. joins the business, kind of a steady Eddie. Um, his father was the founder, very entrepreneurial. CF Jr. carried on in his father's footsteps, as is often the case in family businesses. The second generation kind of just carries the baton forward for the next generation. He and his father dealt with a lot of stuff that was way beyond their control. A couple of pretty significant wars. One really significant war, the Civil War, and economic upheavals, periodic booms and busts as America comes into its own throughout the 1800s. Towards the end of the 1800s, the third generation. Frank Henry joins the business. Frank Henry, more entrepreneurial. He also finds, as we come into the 20th century, more stability, more political and economic stability. And other than World War I, he had a pretty good run from the turn of the century right up until the Great Depression. So let's talk for a minute about some of the things that, that he was instrumental, pardon the pun, with in terms of our history. People would get together and play, well as you can see, guitar, a harp, but banjos and mandolins. Can you imagine an orchestra full of banjos and mandolins? I've never heard one. I'm not sure I want to, but that's, that's what was popular. So CF says I'm going to get into that, or Frank says I'm going to get into that business, goes to New York City to have a conversation with Mr. Zobish. Mr. Zobish was our distributor. Mr. Zobish was an age peer of the founder, okay? So here you've got Mr. Zobish, old man. Two generations later, Frank Henry. Frank goes in, says, Mr. Zobish, I plan to enter the mandolin business and I'm looking for your support. And Mr. Zobish says, oh, don't bother. I am importing my own proprietary line of mandolins and our book is full. We don't need any competition, thank you. Well, that didn't sit well. The discussion turned to an argument and the partnership was resolved. And from that point on, by the late 1890s, we took responsibility not only for the manufacture, but the distribution of our products. And it was actually a good thing because today we distribute Martin Guitars worldwide. The mandolin, some of them were uh, amazingly ornate, just, just over the top. I mean, just crazy, crazy stuff. The ukulele has been part of the Martin line off and on for well over 100 years. The first ukulele boom occurred thanks to the Pan Pacific Exposition that was held in San Francisco, and one of the pavilions was all about Hawaii. Featured everything Hawaii, Hawaiian, people went crazy. And you could, by that point, you could take a steamship to Hawaii, but you couldn't bring the climate back. But there were things that, that you could keep from that culture. And one of those things was the ukulele. The ukulele itself is actually an, a Hawaiian adaptation of a Portuguese folk instrument. The instrument itself was brought to the Hawaiian Islands by Portuguese sailors who were whaling. And when they would stop in the port, they would leave behind some of their uh, indigenous instruments. The Hawaiians incorporated them into their culture. So Frank Henry says, okay, I'm going to get into the business of making ukuleles. And he makes some just like little guitars. And he sends them out and the dealers send them back. And they say, these things don't sound very good. And he said, gee, maybe I should do some market research. So he got a hold of some product that was coming out of the Hawaiian Islands and said, oh my, these are really delicate. They're really lightly made. He was overbuilding. And so he said, okay, we've got to do, do it right. Made some new ones, dropped the spruce top, lightened up the, the bracing, thinned out the veneers, started to use mahogany rather than spruce and rosewood. And then of course later koa wood. And I, how on earth they got koa wood from the Hawaiian Islands to Nazareth, Pennsylvania in the 1910, 1920 is beyond me, but it happened. And sure enough, People wanted Martin ukuleles. So a good year back then for us with guitars, three, four, five, maybe 6,000 guitars. In 1924, we built 14,000 ukuleles. Yeah, we put an addition on the old factory just to accommodate the demand. And it raced right up to the Great Depression and fell off a cliff. Came back briefly. Thanks to Arthur Godfrey in the 1950s, who went on television, played ukulele, and it's back again. Nobody really knows why. Uh, someone said to me, part of it is YouTube. 
that there's just so much stuff on YouTube about ukuleles. I think part of it is they're fun. They're easy to play. There's lots of good imported ukuleles out there. Uh, we are still sort of the, the, top, the, the top of the line for ukuleles. And if you're going to stick with it, hopefully someday, um, you'll work your way up to a Martin ukulele. As people were asking us to make guitars that would have more volume, back then the philosophy was in, increase the proportions in proportion to keep the balance between bass, mid-range, and treble. And that, if you look at how the line evolved up to the dreadnought, you can see that sort of everything gets a little bit bigger in terms of the body to try and keep that volume and tone proportionate to each other. More importantly, and this also deserves a book to be written, is the adaptation by us of the steel string. The steel string at this point is not a new invention, um, but it, it, it's just something that people were looking for from us. And now we're really starting to break ourselves away from the Spanish tradition. Even though they still look, to some extent, like a Spanish guitar, because they have metal strings rather than gut. And gut strings were very difficult to make and very expensive and very temperamental. We actually improved the performance of the guitar, not only in terms of volume, but in terms of just usability by putting more affordable metal strings on them. And honest to goodness, we never looked back. And that's the point at which we kind of gave the market back to the Spanish builders in terms of gut. And then of course, thanks to DuPont, uh, later nylon strings, and really now solidified our position as the creator of the Western guitar, the flat top steel string acoustic guitar.